Hey everyone, looks like we are live and we have a good audience here and uh, welcome to the Oregon BHA fourth uh, pint night uh, or get together, virtual get together, however you want to look at it. We've been um, putting these together just to kind of have some moments of uh, sanity during COVID, but also to make sure that we are uh, reaching out and figuring out uh, topics that are pertinent to uh, uh, back on Andrews and Anglers and all of you out there. Um, and tonight we are super thrilled and humbled to have um, speaker, author, business owner, um, Chad Brown, who runs Soul River. Um, I'll let him tell you more about that organization in a moment. But uh, he, if you didn't see in the, in the write-up, wrote an article about uh, systemic racism in the out of doors. And I know a lot of us don't really think about that. We, you know, look at these public spaces as truly public and places that we can escape some of the craziness that we deal with in our lives. And it's rather jarring to think that some people aren't able to do that. Um, so without further ado, I would like to welcome you, Chad, and, and thank you so much for, uh, for taking the time to speak with us tonight. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, you, you guys, just, you know, any kind of uh, opportunity platform to be able to get in front of new folks and share and, and talk and you know it's it's um it's a beautiful thing so yeah thank you for having me yeah well again we really do appreciate it i know you and i've communicated a little bit offline about that but we really are thrilled and it's definitely you know as part of the 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 bha or pardon me backcountry hunters and anglers for those maybe watching who aren't members uh kind of ideology is that we definitely want accessibility and that includes accessibility for all so um I, I'm going to go ahead and just dive right into it. I do people, I, uh, pardon me real quickly though, for people watching me at home, if I lean in and out, I have a little uh, Word document over here, some notes on it. I didn't want to forget anything that um, I wanted to ask Chad and also bring up. But also there is a uh, an ask a question um, box at the bottom of the windows here, which you can type in questions. So after Chad is done talking or if it's something really pertinent, we can bring that up. But we're happy to have a Q&A after as long as Chad wants to stay and talk. Um, so please uh, chime in there. And, and uh, I do already see one awesome comment in the chat that says love is king. And I completely agree. So thank yeah. you so much yeah. for posting that, Richard. Um, but uh, right off the bat, Chad, I mean, just some background about you. If you could tell us about both you and um, Soul River. And I know I'm sure that could fill several books, but uh, give the, the standard on that. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, yeah, I as far as me personally, uh, just a little nutshell. I'm a Navy veteran. Um, also, I, I'm, uh, my background is, um, is is coming from a creative uh, world uh, as a creative director photographer. Uh, spent a lot of time in that world um, and then coming out of that world and um, dealing with a lot of heavy uh, darkness that came into my life uh, years back. Um, finally, basically getting diagnosed with PTSD. Uh, so I had to deal with a lot of that and that really kind of just ripped me out of the society and put me in a really, really dark place for a good stint of my life and I had to deal with a lot of heavy uh, demons and uh, uh, heavy medication and through a lot of support and help, which that help came from uh, from anglers and, and hunters and, and conservation group, uh, you know, people, excuse me, that I was able to connect with, which it wasn't something I was seeking out. It was something that um, that just kind of fell into my lap, you know, and it started out as uh, a friend took me to the river and, um, and said, you know, this is where I used to come uh, when I was going through my divorce. And here I am standing on the river and, you know, my friend was uh, showing me this river here and, and, I, and she was telling me I was going through my divorce and I would come here and fish all the time, you know. So uh, here I am strung out on heavy medication and, um, you know, so I just said, well, how do you do, I mean, how do you get into it? What do you need to do? Um, just right behind us, um, there was a fishing uh, store right there, went over there, picked up me a rod, uh, some flies. I didn't know anything about fly fishing, anything, you know, I just picked it up and went out there and, uh, started to, you know, cast out a couple times and my cast was like all jacked up and wind blowing it all over the place, <laughs> you know, but it hit the water, you know, the fly hit the water, you know, and, and when it hit that water, 
I think maybe on my third cast or fourth cast, I hooked it on a small uh, Jack Salmon, you know? And so I was hooting and hollering all over the place. I mean, I think everybody heard me in that, in that part. <laughs> you, know? Yeah. Uh, you know, so, you know, and that was when I kind of put two and two together and I was like, you know, this is, um, this is what makes me happy because I'm in a, I was in a phase in my life where I was going through a lot of darkness, a lot of pain, strung on heavy medications, um, you know, where I've forgotten how to smile, you know, I've forgotten, what it feels like just to feel the wind brush against your cheek, you know? I've forgotten a lot of little details that just make you just feel alive, you know? And plus I was really, really disconnected from family. And so when I hooked in on that fish, that is really what brought a lot of excitement and joy uh, that I haven't had in a long time, you know? And it felt just that good. And it felt so good that I felt like my excitement was pushing that medication out of my pores. That's just how excited I was, you know? And so that made me feel alive. And so moving forward, I went to the docs, you know, at the VA and the VA basically said, um, you know, the docs order said, well, we want to get behind you. They literally wrote me a prescription to continue to fish more. Uh, stay in the outdoors, fish more. We'll wing you off your meds and we will, uh, as long as you uh, make an agreement with us to do your one-on-one group med- uh, uh, one-on-one group therapy and and one uh, and and personal therapy, basically, and so that's what I did, and I did that, and I continue to do that, and got winged off the meds. I got stronger. Got to a point one day when I was on the water, I uh, said to myself, "You know what? I'm ready to kick some ass and I get back into society." But this time, me stepping back into society, this is a new chapter in my life, and. What I want to do is what made me happy being in the outdoors and being on that water and how nature and how that water worked with me and helped me through my healing. Um, I want to be able to bring people to the river so they can find their healing at the same time, you know, and find out what nature is and and what that does for you, basically. Uh, So I, you know, put two and two together. Um, You know, um, I'm from uh, the urban world. Uh, I was once that at-risk kid, broken home family. I tied myself uh, into gangs growing up, um, you know, and uh, and I know what it feels like to be as a veteran and wanting just to get acknowledged and seen in society when you come back, you know, especially when you're dealing with those demons and stuff, you know. So uh, putting those pieces together, that's when I came up with Soul River, uh, which is my organization. Um, you know, Soul River is about bringing uh, at-risk urban kids, especially youth of color, uh, and merge with uh, veterans and use veterans as a way of acting as life coaches. Because that's what I call the veterans, basically. They're like life coaches, great mentors. They 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 bring to the table phenomenal of, of skill sets and life experiences. Um, you know, and and when I'm talking with folks and talking about this, you know, too many people always like to use the analogy of the iron sharpening iron process. You know, you you got two soldiers uh, on the river together. One soldier fought for their country. They serve and now they're back and now they're serving to connect the youth. And that youth is also a young soldier that's fighting to be heard and seen with their voice in the urban world, you know, and all the barriers that they're going through, you know. So they're fighting really, really hard, you know. And so when you bring these two together, you got these two soldiers kind of working in this iron sharpening iron process that's forming and it forms a community. It forms a tribe, you know, right there on the water, you know? And so it was, uh, you know, so that's kind of like how Soul River was formed and that's what it's about today. And that mission is still the same. The beauty of that mission and what we do, how we break barriers is the day one when I started the organization is we wanted to make sure that we, there's zero cost. There's no, there's no burden of financial burden for that youth or for that veteran. And so I use the organization as a way, kind of like a Robin Hood, you know, I go out and I raise the money, I knock on the doors, I I go out the grants, et cetera. We bring that money and and our main agenda is to make sure that when that youth comes into the fold and that veteran comes in the fold, is that there's no worry concern about financial costs of gear, food, transportation, et cetera. It's the organization that carries that burden, just like a community that carries that burden. You know, when you come together as a community, we stand together as one, right? You know, we look after for one another. If someone's young or someone's someone's crippled or someone's hurt, or whatever the case is, as a community, we have to be able to step in and stand up for that person and lift that person up 
That's the same thing how Soul River operates, basically. You know, from a veteran standpoint, our ultimate mission is to ultimately raise that kid up in the outdoors and give them a platform and opportunity to become a leader for tomorrow's conservation. That's our ultimate goal. And that's what we're about, you know. And so we bring these youth in. We forge our relationships on the river. We use fly fishing as a way of, of, of uh, integrating community, integrating love, integrating respect, integrating responsibility. And, and, and we build from there into leadership, into outdoor um, you know, uh, education, fly fishing, fly fishing 101, uh, etymology, the study of water, science, biology. You know, the youth go through a process, they become uh, you know, familiar with the lay, you know, with the lay of the land, how to read a topographic map, how to read a compass, how to navigate the, the back country, how to call the shots in a canoe when you're working with the team, you know. So and this is all fostered and created by veterans, you know, and the veterans foster these kids. Now, when we come back from our deployments, which we call them deployments, uh, you know, it doesn't stop right there. You know, what we do is veterans and me we basically work with conservation groups and we open up doors on Capitol Hill. We set up meetings in congressional spaces and we train the youth and get them to learn how to use their voice, how to be able to advocate for our wildlife, for our fresh water, for all the issues that are happening. And we bring them into those spaces and they learn how to carry that burden as a community leader and be able to voice that in front of congressional people and talk about that. What better way for, for a congressional to be able to sit back and hear from a youth from that next generation, which is a breath of fresh air. It's a new story, right? It's a new narrative, uh, you know, and, and the beauty is that, you know, and when you're in that space, you got veterans that just literally, we step a step back and we give them that support, that over the top confidence of what veterans got automatically by default in their soul, you know? And so, yeah. um, but yeah, that's in a nutshell, you know, and, and there's, there's a lot more, but I don't want to. <laughs> well, and, and, and honestly, Chad, I appreciate even that much. I mean, I think everyone can, but first off, I, I already know that people are going to be like a prescription to fisher hunt is what we all should have. I mean, that's like, yeah. I see some comments on the side already. I mean, yeah. And, and, and I guess that's what, uh, is so fascinating to so many about it. And maybe fascinating is the completely wrong word, or maybe it's even appalling is that, you know, we all come together in these groups, backcountry hunters and anglers and other groups that you've already spoken with, because we are, we feel like we are a community and we feel like we are together. And, you know, and then like I mentioned, when I read your article, I talked to Chad about this, it was, it was just a different way of thinking about things. And, and, you know, I have my own experiences, but obviously they're not, not yours and not anybody else's. And so right. to have someone be so uh, so eloquent, but also upfront and stated about it was really both refreshing, but a, a bit alarming, to be frank. And, mm -hmm. and, and I, I mean, I know a lot of this was, um, well, I shouldn't assume, but I assume a lot of this was spawned by the death of George Floyd. And since he is mentioned in the article, um, so maybe you can tell, tell us, I mean, I, and I appreciate all of the, the, the background about Soul River, and I do want to touch on that one more time before yeah. we leave and, and let everyone know, please go Google his website, pull it up. It's a great website. I've been all over it and, and, and everything. But what? But while we transition away from that and, and, and into this larger fear of community is what compelled you to write that article? I mean, that's really what I wanted to kind of get into today, yeah. uh, aside from what you do, which is so respectable. Sure. But, sure. you know, uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's not, I'm going to say, you know, the, the, the George Foreman, that, that was, I'm going to, I'm going to just going to call it a tipping point. I really don't have much to really go in depth about the situation other than what has happened. It was a bad situation, uh, you know, and it, it frustrated me. It frustrated a lot of people in our society. Uh, uh, but his death was, was, uh, was, uh, was, 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 yeah, it was just bad. It wasn't, it, sh it shouldn't happen like that. But the bottom line is that it's a tipping point, you know, um, and that tipping point uh, opened up a lot of different uh, concerns and worries amongst a lot of people. But the thing is, is like, you know, I, I just want to come back and you know, when you mentioned about, you know, uh, George Foreman that, that started, but the reality is that there's a unheard of voices that's been going on for 
uh, years. Yeah, agreed. Years. Agreed. I mean, I was I was bringing it up with a friend of mine. I said, "This is yeah. This is. I mean, it makes me a little sick that the memory of people is so short." I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm old, <laughs> whether I look at it or not. Sure. Uh, I remember uh, Rodney King. I remember all of these and the Los Angeles riots. And it's like this happens every five or 10 years and there's a uproar about it. And then people sort of, it's inconvenient. Right. Or their memory is short or both. Or And I'm not trying to castigate anyone for that. We all have so many things going on. But right. um, so I, that's why I was, you know, happy to see your article and, and, and thrilled that it brought it to a group of people that maybe aren't thinking about it in their sphere, which again, we all think about it in the general populace, but maybe we don't think about it in hunting and fishing. And so that's why I was so thrilled to see that. Yeah. And, you know, and, you know, it's been around us, you know, in the urban world, it's been around us in the outdoor world. You know, when you do, if you do your research and in, in, in the history that you're talking about, like everything we're talking about is urban world, but we're, but there's a, uh, there's a, um, the land is is the back country of the land is is you can almost pretty much as a metaphor is soaked in blood. You know, it's there's no closure for people of color from indigenous nations, uh, you know, from Hispanic communities. And so there is a generational fear that's never been dealt with. It's been overlooked uh, and and there's never been closure, you know, and and so. You know, when we're, when we're talking about the generational fear, it rolls itself over into every generation from grandma, from great grandma, great grandpa. They talk about it over and over and it goes to the youth today, even even to myself, you know. So George Foreman, Foreman what happened to him, the tipping point is to for me, it was it was a lifetime of me on this earth. I'm frustrated. It was a it's a lifetime of what I've been exposed to. It's a lifetime of what what I have encountered. You know, uh, it's a lifetime. I'm not a stranger to the outdoors. I'm I'm you know, I, and that's one thing I forgot to say, but you know, my background, you know, it's not the fishing, but I come from a hunting and family, uh uh hunters of, of, of farmers, hunters and farmers. I come from hunters and farmers, long line, you know. My great grandpa was one of the black cowboys. You know, I grew up on the land, you know, my my grandmother, you know, she farmed the land. You know, we had pigs. We got we raised Brahma cows. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, I remember when I was young, my father and my grandma, they would take the cows and take them up to the market and auction them up. You know, it was a upbringing lifestyle at age you know, seven years old. You know, my grandpa and my father took me out on my first hunt and gave me a little 22 rifle, you know, and so. You know, but you know that's that is that's like a black family upbringing on the land on the farm with a still with a fear and and with the uh, uh, the slave uh, stories, you know, and and you know being a black cowboy is a whole different walk versus a white cowboy that you see on television. Two different worlds. Two, two complete different worlds, you know, uh, you know, and so, you know, so where I'm coming from and, and me writing, it's a, it's my walk of the things that I've been experienced, even as an outdoor person, that my voice uh, that's multiplied by the hundred thousands of people of color has that same voice and fear. And it's something that we talk about a lot, you know, and and it's it's a really important thing to look at to ones and you know and what I'm what I'm what I'm saying here in, in speaking is uh, I'm asking you know people even including the articles that it may be a little bit in the forefront and it may be like wow it it, it can't exist what I'm asking is to take the time and sit with what I'm saying that's that's what I'm asking you know sit with what I'm saying here you know. Uh, my skin is black. I have a different lens when I go into the outdoors. This Hispanic man is is brown skin. This Native American, there's a different lens. There's a different way of how you are accepted when you enter not just the outdoor world, but enter through the the the, the challenges through urban world. It's a different lens, you know. And 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 so when the foreman happened. 
I was frustrated. I needed to talk about this, but I was also I was also afraid. I have to say I was also afraid. Really, it, what I was afraid of is uh, I didn't want. Uh, I was concerned about my organization getting attacked. You know, uh, because it happens. You know, there's there's a balance of good people and there's a balance of people that's up to no good. Period. You know, and 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 so the platform that I'm already on and. Uh, the exposure that I've already received on a national level. This is just one more piece for me to step out and make myself more vulnerable, you know. And but my faith and me writing this, I was like, you know what? This is a this is a strength of power that I need to actually um, uh, exercise here. I need to exercise me as a leader, me as a founder and president of my organization, representing people of color, of young people for tomorrow. Uh, representing veterans, this is my job. This is what I need to do, and I need to. And I got something to say. I need to put it out there. And you know what? I also need to prepare for the blows I'm going to take. You know, and some of that did come. You know, and and but that comes with the program. That totally comes with the program. But that doesn't stop what I'm doing, though. You know, uh, when I'm out there on deployments, when I'm working with youth of color, there's a big fear in the back of my head. There's been many times when I would talk to some of fellow veterans or or my board members, I'm saying, you know what? Uh, we're about to do this doing. Do you think we're going in this area? Do you think we need to carry? You know, that's ridiculous to think like that. But the fact is, like, you know what? I got kids out there. You know, I got people colored kids out there, for God's sake, you know? And that's on my watch. That is on my watch. And so I'm having to be very vigilant and, and keep my eyes open to make sure that the experience that we do, we are able to do in the most healthiest space and comfortable space to allow these young people to be able to step in and enjoy nature of how it's supposed to be enjoyed without having the fear or concern of what grandma and what mom is already saying. They're already afraid of that, you know, and the youth, well, they, they feel that same way, you know, and so, yeah, and so that's, that's kind of right where the uh, the um, I would say the the boiling point for me was, yeah, I need to say something. And then on top of that, what happened to George is the same thing that can happen to me. You know, I identify with that. I'm a black man. I'm you know, uh, if if you wouldn't know me, uh, you know, I can put my black hood on and walk, and I will look just like the past uh, 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 fellow brothers that been sh shot and passed. You know, but no justice. I can look just like George, you know, if you didn't know who I was, you know, I don't dress like a, uh, like a hunter or a angler. I don't, you know, I have my own style. I come to the water. I come to the outdoors in my own way. That's how the river accepts me. And that's how the river should accept everybody, you know, and I totally have my own style, you know, so me having my own style that does separates me and it does put a target. You know, and people like look at me as like, oh, who, who is this guy? Whatever. I don't because I like to dress how I want to dress, you know, but I shouldn't have to think like that. I should be able to come to the water as who I am and enjoy the outdoors the, as much as I can. But I can't. It's a, it's a hard it's a hard thing for me to do. Uh, you know, I've been shot at, you know, I've been, I've been shot at twice. You know, hey, nigger, get off my river, you know. Um, the word nigger, you know, that doesn't affect me anymore. That hits me. But what affects me is this mindset of my river. You know, that, that's um, what sticks with me, you know, because yeah. where, who's the owners here? I mean, technically, if we want to go deeper, we can look at indigenous cultures, you know, if we want to go there, you know, but we don't need to go there, but Right now, as we look at the wilderness, back country, the rivers that runs free on public lands, on wildlife refuge, on you know national parks, these spaces is for everybody to enjoy. I should be able to walk out in on a trail and walk into back country and and and, and fish my life off and 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 have not an ounce of concern, but there's concern. 
you know well, there, you're bringing up so much because it's 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 and this is exactly what i was hoping i so appreciate it and and i completely agree i mean that's exactly what i mean we try and hang our head on right is it's public lands for everybody i mean you're absolutely yeah. right and that and I know I've said this to you in email, and I still mean it. If you ever want to go fish or hunt, you give me a call or an email, man. And I don't know. I'll go fish. Yeah. I'll go fishing out with you. Yeah. I don't. I, yeah. But uh, but but I I appreciate you giving us some of those experiences because I think um, as as bad as it sounds, there is a certain inability to relate if you're not in your shoes. Period. Yeah. And. So I was going to even ask you, and, and I mean, you've already given us a, 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 a microcosmic look, but, you know, I mean, if maybe you could give us a few more examples of just personally, not not even necessarily the kids, but what you or friends of yours that are black have experienced um, either in an outdoor stop, shop, uh, yep. outdoor public spaces, et cetera. I, I'm sure we'd be very interested. Sure. First, I need to tell you, you may want to fix yourself a big pot of coffee. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You know, but uh, no, but seriously, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, I got, got stories. I got quite a few. I mean, even my personal story, it happens to me all the time. You know what? I'm I'm uh, um, um, I'm an athletic built type of guy. I, you know, uh, I don't dress, you know, like a lot of outdoor folks and everything. I have my own style, uh, you know, and so the way I look and carry myself, which it shouldn't be about that. It's not about. I should not be the way I look, number one, period. But when I go into an, like an outdoor shop and I'm looking, there's been many times, and no joke, I would not have to say anything. I would go look at it. This happens a lot. I would look at a backpack or a product, and that person will make a judgment of the fact and probably make this, this judgment of the fact that me being black and poor. And so, excuse me, sir, instead of looking at that backpack, uh, these are actually much cheaper over here. I haven't said anything, you know. I'm just I'm looking. I'm looking at the backpack. I know what I'm looking at. I'm just you know. But this this quick to to make this judgment, you know. And I was say, I said no. This is what I want. This is what I'm looking at. And you know. And so if I have any questions, I will I will ask you. But right now, uh, I'm looking at this backpack. This is what I want. You know. Uh, you know, and, and yeah, you know, so that happens to me all the time when I walk into uh, uh, an outdoor shop all the time. You know, um, I got a buddy of mine. I, I said I'm, I actually I wrote about this in the article. Uh, it was the uh, part about um, 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 it was the part about the um, my, my break lines, you know, and uh, that actually that actually there's a, the story to that is. It's a good buddy of mine. He's a uh, he's a retired um, uh, cage fighter, mar mixed martial arts uh, fighter from L down in L.A. Uh, um, Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican guy, done extremely well. Uh, he retired. Uh, uh, he's a little bit banged up and everything like that. Met his wife. His wife is what connected me to her husband. And um, and when he found out that I fly fish, he got inspired. He made the connection of seeing a black man. You know, he's a he's a man of color himself. And he was like, oh, man, I would love to try it, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, let's do this, you know? And I started talking about the sport. We hung out a couple times, and he got ready to uh, to go uh, take him fly fishing, and he needed some gear. And we went to this shop right in Portland, and we walked in. You know, his name is Ed. I'm going to give his last name. His name is Ed. And, uh, you know, we're standing in the shop, and I said, Ed, I, you know, we're going to go in and look at some gear. I'm going to show everything you need to get and everything. We just get some help. We stood in there almost a whole hour and um, the folks that was in there in the shop, they were walking around us and talking to and working with people coming in the shop while we were standing there. My boy, my boy, Ed, got so upset. You know, I'm always trying to be really patient and everything like that. And, you know, there was a lot of, you know, the ones that was in there, but we'll, we'll be right with, with you. We'll be, right, we'll be right with you. Well, five people just came into the shop. We've been here for 45 minutes. We're still waiting. Little do they know, again, judgment off of how I look or how he looks. Little do they know, my buddy Ed was prepared to drop seven and a half thousand dollars in there to do what he needs to do. You know, little do they know they, they weren't aware of, you know, the caliber of who this person was. But there was a lot of misjudgments that was being uh, put out, you know, so it got really upset. He got really upset, you know, and he darted out there and he said, listen, man. 
Don't ever take me back to this place again. Don't ever take me back here again. I do not ever want to step into this place again. I don't care, you know? And I say, like, Ed, it's all good. You know what? I tell you what, you know, tomorrow's uh, Veterans Day. Let's go to the river. I got some extra gear. You can use my gear. We'll just set up and spend time on the river. We drove out to the river down in the chutes. Me and Ed pulled up behind the Subaru car. Uh, there was two white anglers down probably maybe uh, 40 yards down on the river. I'm going to just shoot fishing. Me and Ed get out of my rig. You know, I put my waders on. He get his stuff, get the, you know, get the rods and everything like that. By the time we start to make our way down the path, those two white anglers are passing us up. I'm being really friendly. Hey, how you doing? Hope you have a good day. You know, would you fish well? Blah, blah, blah. You know, it was a little small talk. That's all it was. Me and Ed, we are on that river and we're fishing. We had a great time. We hooked in the fish left and right. You know, it was awesome. It was also the type that um, he was all about fishing because what he liked, he actually liked wading in the water because the river, uh, what he found was it was healing to his wounds being a, a mixed martial arts fighter, you know? And so his wounds, and so he just like, I said, hey, what you doing? He said, man, I'm just like, wait a minute. This just feels so good, man. I don't even want to do anything. I'm just going to sit right here. And I said, yo, you know, sit right there. You know, we had an awesome time. He's an awesome guy, you know? And so, you know, sun started to go down. We made our way back up, get into my car, Subaru's off, and um, drive down maybe no more than, uh, I'm going to say probably 50, 40 yards. And then all of a sudden, psh, all over the place, you know? Uh, I was so upset. We got out, we looked, brake lines completely pulled out, completely pulled out, you know? Uh, and I mean, I had still belted brake lines for God's sake, you know? I mean, it took, it took a little strength to you know, pull them out, but all, and then the engine was jacked up underneath where I couldn't pull my gear ship out. You know, my, my whole front was just jacked up. It was completely upset. Here it is where we are in the canyons, and um, uh, and we need help, you know, cell phones not working. So we sat there, you know, cars going by, my hood is up, <laughs> you know, no, it's not stopping. We're still here, you know, and, and I, and I told you, I said, I can't believe this has happened. And Ed was just, you know, of course we had a whole different type of colorful language happening at that time, you know, we're down there, you know, and, uh, um, you know, and then, um, um, you know, sooner or later, there was a ranger that came through and we and, and I told the ranger what happened. He took a report. Uh, he submitted it and everything like that. And he took off. We needed some help. Uh, I didn't know how to help. So, you know, a ranger, we thought the ranger was going to actually come back and, and, and help us and everything like that. He did take a report, but, you know, didn't fall through. And we still stuck in the damn canyons. So luckily, Ed. Knew a little thing about cars because that's where my talent's in. <laughs> and I don't know nothing about vehicles, stuff like that. And so he got up in there, you know, he had, there was a couple tools in my rig and everything. He got on, and he kind of jerry rigged some stuff uh, to where I was able to pull my gear shift out. So what does two brothers do in our walk, in my walk? We step in faith. That's a different walk. It's a totally different walk. Again, when I'm talking about stepping in faith, I'm talking about being a black man moving through. And that's the thing that we say, we're going to step in faith because we're going to believe that something is going to work for our favor. We don't know how we're going to get there. We don't have a plan, you know, but we're going to we're going to move through this process together and we're going to make this work. You know, um, so Ed was able to get that gear out. We're probably a little over 200 miles from where we at on the Deschutes to Portland, Oregon. How do we get back? We drove on faith without brakes. I used my e-brake to actually help me uh, going over the overpass, over the mountain and everything like that. And Ed was there and it was the most scariest ride we ever had. Not bad. His wife was uh, his wife was on the phone and she was really concerned about us and everything like that. But it was the only way we can get out of there. You know, he I was able to start and we had no brakes. I used my damn e-brake for so much that it just it just made things even worse by the time we arrived in Portland, you know, and everything like that. You know, and so I was just like, I can't believe this. You know, and, and I told that I'll never forget this. You know, but you know what? There's a lot of things I'll never forget. Even as a kid being 
part of a football team going back and I walk into a locker room and I'm getting called nigger, you know, you know, and I mean, it's just, you know, you grow up with this stuff. And that's, and so that's what I'm talking about. It's this, these are unheard experiences that as a, as a being black, having black skin, it's a different approach and how we are perceived when we are especially moving into the outdoors. And let me just say one thing about the outdoors. You know, the outdoors is a place of, it is a place of healing and it's a place of where we can relax and we can rec recreate, et cetera. But what I'm talking about the outdoors is metaphorically is really, it's the people that are from that urban world that are in that hate and that ignorance and they also have recreation activities in the outdoors. We bring that shit, oh, excuse my friends, I'm sorry, to, you know, we bring that into the outdoors. We bring hate into the outdoors. We bring ignorance into the outdoors, you know. Uh, you know, we, we, we bring all this kind of, you know, mental just, you know, mess into the outdoors. You know, so some of us are out there, we are operating in healthy spaces, yeah. You know, but some of us also encounter these kind of things, you know. And so what John and Sally is doing with this, maybe with the anarchy group or or a racist group or whatever, they're just as much as a hunters as you are. They're just as much as a hunter as I am. They're just as much as an angler that you or me are backpacker. You know, they're pursuing that, you know, so that's going into the outdoors. So what happens? We encounter that. You know, and 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 so there's that there's and then it established that fear, but it's much more justified because we're able to see that and it happens, you know, uh, we, you know, and, and so it's it's yeah. Anyway, I'm going to let you uh, speak. I'm, yeah. you know, go no, no, I, 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 yeah, I appreciate it. And, and obviously it's a it's a it's a deep hole to dive down. And obviously one one chat online is not going to change the world um right. you know and, and obviously that's not the goal of this the goal of this is just to try to understand and also to be able to move forward as a community and and, and again everything i'm hearing you say i think everyone here is, is able to agree with and understand that that the outdoors is healing that the outdoors belongs to everyone that the that whether we like it or not certain people are treated differently based upon the way they look the way they act who they are um, and of course, that's reprehensible and abhorrent to me. But you know, it's just an, a, a fact, unfortunately, for some people. But I guess my other question on this, and I know you kind of, you and I kind of chatted about this offline as well, as I asked the question, and, and I don't know if you have a good answer because you're bringing up a ton here, Chad, and I and I, I could go on and listen to this all night. I really could. But what what solutions are there? I mean, what? do we do as sportsmen and women or, and even just as people? I mean, I'm, you know, obviously in the outdoors, of course, but how do we not let this conversation fall aside like we were talking about where it's that short term uh, uh, introspection, but also just as individual groups. I mean, you're talking to all these groups, uh, Oregon Wild, um, uh, you're on the uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife podcast, obviously you're on ours and many more. What's the overreaching hope? Uh, or what can we do? Uh, the first thing, you know, there's just a lot of things, and you're right. You know, this is uh, uh, I'm 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 kind of vomiting <laughs> a lot here, you know, and um, oh, I understand. And, and so uh, it's it's a big it's a big mountain, and the best way to climb this mountain, we got to chip away a little bit here. To chip away a little bit is actually, you know, you know, basically we have to do. Uh, self reflection on the on, on what has happened. We got to be able to bring closure to what has happened. We're talking years of experience, years of hurt and pain. Uh, you know, in order to deal with that, in order to step into those spaces uh, and deal with the year, it's not saying I'm sorry. Really, it's really actually we need to start. We white folks and African American folks, Hispanics, we need to start. <laughs> acting more out of showing love for one another. That's the most important thing. And what I'm talking about love is, it's not the relationship between, uh, you know, uh, and marriage and relationships and everything. I'm talking about the kind of love that takes a certain sense of strength to step into an uncomfortable space where you feel comfortable and be able to guide 
by your heart in order to do what's right. And that's by connecting with people of color. You know, that's by integrating with people of color. I'm asking some, what I'm saying is, is we need to like let our differences drop and we need to reveal ourselves in the most, most vulnerable way and accept what is there. And it feels uncomfortable. Fine. That's how it's supposed to feel because people of color have been feeling uncomfortable for many, many years. They're already in that space. You know, they're already trying to, you know, uh, uh, raising their hand, you know, are, are, are asking for help or needing help. They're already in the space. And what do they do? They adapt and improvise to the situation. They step out on faith. They work together. They come together. They use love as a way of hope. Right. And they use love as a way of creating path. I mean, I remember the days when my mom would say to me, uh, son, I don't know how we're going to get there, but we're going to get there. You know, that's that's the kind of love I'm talking about, you know, and for Caucasians, you know, that are wanting to do the good to step back, not turn the cheek of what's happening here, but to acknowledge and look what's happening and be able to step into that space and say, hey, brother, hey, sister, how can I help you? How can I be part of what you're doing? You know, these are fundamentally basics of what I'm talking about before we can even get to the tip of that mountain. Those fundamental basics establish a trust across the platform. You know, uh, indigenous cultures, they built their relationships off of trust. You know, historically, their trust has been taken away. It's been misled, misguided. Same thing with African-American history. Same thing with Hispanic history. You know, you know, but if we bring that together and we reestablish a trust and be authentic in who we are. That's a first step right there. You know, uh, when we can establish that, we can actually grow to another space of how do we work together? You know, we can come up with not just the mission statement or what a lot of, you know, companies are doing today. They're redoing their mission statement, putting it out there. It's nice to acknowledge, but we want more than that. And what we want is we want action to be pulled out of that mission statement. You know, let's sit down and work together and come up with five actions. And these five actions is what's going to hold us accountable. It's going to hold you accountable. It's going to hold me accountable. Right. You know, and we be able to walk this walk together, you know, and when we got those five actions aligning and we got that we got that set up in the right way. Guess what? If I fall. If I fall short, if something happens, guess what? With the system that we just created, you can pick me up. You can not just pick me up, but you can carry me because we got a love here that we are working together and we're able to come together. And we able to work together. You know, you're not going to let me fall back, just like in the military. You know, uh, you know, dead man's carry. You know, you you pick your brother up. If your brother fall, no matter if he got a broke leg, a shot, whatever, what do you do? You pick your brother up and you bring him home. That's what you do. You know, yeah. no matter what it is, you know. And so when we look at that analogy and go back to the community and how that community is formed, we're talking about the fundamental basics of applying love for one another and supporting one another. The fundamental basics. Love is king. That's just that's 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 where we need to live at and where we need to start living at. And when we start living at, we we're, we're not judging no more. We're not we're not uh, uh, preamping uh, our our emotion. Uh, not we're not preamping and allowing our emotions to turn. Uh, a response without listening. We need to be better listeners, you know, instead of, you know, because right today, what we do is, especially when riots or not even riots, but all kinds of stuff happens are when I go to my brother and he said, what's wrong? I, I share. And the worst thing what you can do is just go ahead and preamp what you need to say. What I need you to do is listen to what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I'm sharing you my, my experience of what has happened to me. That's what I'm saying. I need you to really listen to that. I'm not I'm not asking you to come up with solutions. Right now, I'm hurt. 
Right now, what I just experienced is a, is, is a painful experience. And if you really hear as my brother, if you really hear as my sister, you're going to take the time and hear me. You may even take the time and give me a hug. I may need that more than what your preamp solutions are going to, or, or, to present to me. You know, right now, I don't need that. Right now, what I need is to be acknowledged. And I need you to see me for who I am and for what's going on here. You know, and that's when love steps in. Love steps in for that brother and that sister. It allows us to cross the platform. It allows us to step across the line, you know, and connect, you know, and we have, we're missing that. We're missing that, you know, our foundation of what this country's built, built on for many, many years, it's cracked. It's freaking cracked. There's a whole bunch of cracks here, you know, to feel, you know, I'm not a politician, you know, <laughs> nothing like that, but to fill these cracks, is to be filled with the love. We need to step in and those are the voice. That's how we need to step in to make that platform stronger to where we can work together. That's where we can start by community. You know, uh, I'm a big fan of Senator Ron White in, 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 or in Oregon, and he always talks about his famous uh, slogan or, or his, his word is like bottoms up. You know, you don't, you know, you don't, you don't build from the top. You don't go to the CEOs and everything. It's it all starts bottoms up, you know. And 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 I and I really I believe that you know community. It's it's not the decision makers. We can get to the decision makers later, you know. But if we can get to the people and cultivate that community, and we can integrate ourselves and we can start practices that love, we stands much more in a stronger position of a powerful army to dismantle racism, hate, ignorance, as we're moving forward together. We are linking up brother, brother, black and white, and we're walking together here. We're walking through our urban world, we're walking through our outdoor world, and we standing strong together. You know, I know for a fact that if I fall, my brother and my sister are gonna catch me. But right now, that's not gonna happen. You know, that's not gonna happen, you know? Uh, you know, and so, so you know, the basics of what I'm saying here is to answer your question is uh, we 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 need to really start practicing uh, with, uh, with and exercising our love for one another. That's where we need to start at first, you know, uh, and really understanding the people's stories because people of color got stories just as much as white folks. OK, I don't want you know, they got stories, too, you know, uh, especially women, you know, all across the place, because when I'm when that article put out, you know, there's women that actually emailed me, not, you know, black, Indian, uh, Caucasian, that has fear of men, period. You know, being out by myself, you know, they get into groups, you know, everything like that. So that's a whole nother piece right there to attack, you know, is to dismantle the alpha male. It's nothing, I'm not going to knock an alpha male, you know, but how do we represent that in the outdoors to where it does not fear women? Right. Where women feel much comfortable to be an out. And, and, we're, and there are some women out there that do their thing. But that's the less than the one percent. I'm talking about the whole body of women being able to come out and feeling, you know, are we're talking about just African-American men. You know, that's a hot item today because the fact that being black, you are born with the target. You're literally born with the target. You know, I can tell you. Uh, you know, uh, it's a sidestep, but another story. Um, when you look at a black family and you look at a white family, sons and daughters that are growing up, there's this thing called birds and the bees, right? Dad, mom, whatever, you had this conversation, birds and the bees about life and all that kind of stuff and everything like that. Same thing in the black family. But there's one thing that happens in the, in the black family that's different from the white family is the fact that when dad is talking and like my father is talking to me as a young kid, um, he's saying to me, what do you want to do, boy? You know, that's how he talking. What do you want to do, boy? You know, and everything like that, you know, and I'm talking to my dad, I said, well, dad, this is what I want to do. And blah, blah, blah. I want to, you know, I want to be an astronaut, all this kind of stuff. He said, okay, well, son, you're eight years old. It's my job to protect you. And I'm going to have to train you of how to survive. You are a young black boy 
and soon you will become a black man. You, your skin is a target. I need you to understand that. Your skin is a target and I need to do whatever I can to help you survive. Okay, so this is what we're gonna do. So I, I was brought up where my father set me down and taught me what to do if I get pulled over by the cops. This is survival tactics, you know? These are, these are things that we have to do and everything like that. And so there's a difference. So when you're born with black skin, you're born to target, it doesn't matter if you're educated, it doesn't matter where you come from. What matters is the fact that you are black and you got a target and there's people in this world that will not accept that. They got a problem with that, okay? You know, and so going back to your question is, that's when love steps in to help dismantle that. Love steps in to put a shield there to help protect people of color where they are able to be able to understand what it's like to have a Zen moment in the outdoors, you know? You know, and so that's that's what I'm talking about. You know, it's it's and, and it's it's fundamentally coming back to the basics and and building out our love for one another the best way possible. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean that, that. First off, that thank you. That uh, that really touched me. Uh, honestly, um, there's a lot involved in that, and a lot to think about for everyone and to digest on that, and. and I'll, I'll be frank, one of the most common things I get when, when I'm talking to friends about everything going on is, you know, is, is people say, well, I don't know, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. I don't know what kind of allyship or, you know, what movement to join or whatever. And and so I'm, I'm definitely going to be directing them hopefully to watch this and kind of, and kind of listen to you talk about, you know, the first step is just, is actual allyship. It's just yeah. reaching across and, and maybe feeling a bit uncomfortable and, and maybe going outside our boundaries and, and recognizing that we have boundaries, even if we didn't think we did. And, right. and that's why that, that's so, that's so germane to me, Chad. And that's, yeah, I'm having a hard time gathering my words on that. I, honestly, that was, that was awesome. I well, thought that was, that was great, but uh, wow. Yeah. So I, I appreciate that. Cause I know one thing that people did ask me about this is like, you know, well, what can we do? And so, I mean, Aside from, as I mentioned prior, please everyone look up Chad's organization. I mean, I'm sure that you have links on there for volunteerism or support. But beside Chad's organization, please everyone, as Chad is saying, reach out and find someone and connect and become part of that global solution. At least that's what I'm hearing. If, if I'm that's exactly that's exactly what I'm saying. And if you feel uncomfortable, a good rule to look at is that. If you feel so uncomfortable, then you're in the right place. You're doing the right thing. You know, uh, that's how we learn. That's that's how we are able to adapt. That's how we are able to create new friends. You know, uh, if if your world is like this, and that's fine. If, if that's what you want, if your world is like that, you have you have the choice to have your world like that. If you have the heart and you say, you know, I, I, I want to make change, I want to change this, it's going to acquire to be uncomfortable. And the more uncomfortable you are, the more of a better place that you are right now, because that's exactly where you need to be, you know, and you can be able to lean into your resources in that uncomfortable space and open up to help support whatever you're trying to do with a person or with the group or with the company, whatever, you know, I don't know what it is. If you're working yeah. with a young group of people of color, indigenous group of color, uh, Hispanic group of color and everything, and you want to do something, yeah, you may feel uncomfortable and you need to just stay, you need to sit with that. You know, you just need to sit with that, you know, and allow that to turn you open where you can be able to navigate your heart. You know, a lot of us don't do that. A lot of us, you know, 99.9% of the world, whatever, you know, we don't do those things. We think with this, that's what we do all the time. We think with this all the time, you know, we think with this or we say, well, you know, because you help out this, you know, Hispanic or I got a, a black friend. Well, I got a black friend and, you know, I don't see no racism because we get along. Okay. 
It's not about generalizing. It's not about generalizing. You know, it's 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 not about just because you got a black friend. That's not what you see. What the problem or what the situation is, is that he has a different lens when he believes you and he goes off to somewhere else. That's the key piece that you're not understanding, you know, of how we enter companies, spaces, wild spaces. It's a different walk compared to how you would enter company spaces and outdoor spaces. When you step up, when you take a step back and you look at outdoor groups that are together, African American groups, Hispanic groups, Native American groups, when you look at, you got the race, I don't know if anybody ever thought about this, but raise the question of why they're all together. Why are they all together? And that's, it's, that's fine to have groups. I'm not knocking that. But when you find out the reason why they're all together, because why? They feel safe together. They feel this is, this is where they can be able to relax a little bit and enjoy amongst themselves and go into the outdoors because they feel safe and they feel protected. OK, now there are a sprinkle of African-Americans, indigenous, Hispanics of outdoor backcountry folks. But that's just a sprinkle. All right. And that, and, and that sprinkle, just like myself, I'm in that sprinkle as well to where we have grown and we are able to learn how to navigate the backcountry. While marrying with the same fear of the kids in the groups. We still got that fear. We just know how to navigate the backcountry a little differently. You know, we've been around, we've been doing it and everything like that, you know. And so, but you get us leaders around together, you know, people color leaders. We we talk about that all the time. You know, we there's there's quite a few leaders that, you know, in the backcountry from hunters and anglers, uh, you know, some of uh, CEOs that have their own organizations and stuff. And we talk about the same thing all the time. It's an unheard voice that's unspoken and it's real. It's it's so real, you know, uh, you know. And so, yeah, you know, it's it's we we you know, we got to be able to lean in and start bridging people and fought and using our heart uh, to to bring these worlds together. We got to, you know, yeah, practice love. Love is king, period. Well, I completely agree. And and one thing that I, I kind of caught in that as well that, that I actually was already thinking. And so I'm I'm it, it, you know, it's 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 a it's a it's a screen to screen connection maybe somehow here through the through the ether, but uh important to me that you said several times in that is is why, why people are together and, and all those things. And I kept thinking is that that's what people, you know, when you get in that uncomfortable situation or when you're seeking to ally and, and help is is to ask a lot of why. Yeah. Why is this the way it is? Why are why am I the way I am? You don't always ask someone else, why are they the way they are? Well, we can all ask that. I mean, from my view all day long, but you know, why why does why is why does Chad feel the way he does? Why did he write this article? And if you don't know, then obviously ask, but hopefully yeah. we can, you know, investigate and, and seek internal enough to then, as you say, you know, ally, form that alliance and, and truly let let that, that that brotherly bond, you know, come about, and it should come organically in that way. In my sense, I mean, without, a, without uh, organic of uh, being authentic is the most purest and realest way of how you can present yourself to new people, especially people of color. You know, um, yeah, you know, there's, you know, that's that's, and that takes a certain amount of confidence and strength. Build, you know, not everybody. Feel that feels comfortable. That makes right there alone what we just got to talk about. That does make a lot of people feel uncomfortable, you know. Uh, you know, and and you got to be vulnerable. You got to put yourself in that in that space and allow you, that uncomfortableness take over you and feel okay with that. You got to be able to feel okay with that, you know, in order to you to to put work in. The more you put work in, the more the relationship build. Then you know what. Feeling uncomfortable, it washes away. It completely washes away. You know, your lens has changed too. You know, and and so, but yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, and I'm hearing, hopefully not interpreting and self and hearing what I want to hear, but I'm hearing. I mean, throughout this, and even with all the experiences in that that last little bit, especially, is I'm hearing definitely some 
some positivity and some hope um, for that love. And and I do want to ask you if you could, because I don't want this to totally be just. It is. It's a, it's a it's an intense topic. It's a, it's a topic that people need to hear. But I also want people. Hopefully they do. But I want everyone, including myself, to understand. You know, why you love the outdoors and and why everyone loves the outdoors because I I think it's the same. I always you know when I ask someone it it seems like the same or similar answer. So to kind of you know we're coming around a full giant circle, but because I know I asked you before you know what you felt about the outdoors, but because you told us your your background, but if you could make a one word statement and that's really hard, what does the outdoors and, and being outdoors mean to you, Chad? One, you talking about one word? <laughs> yeah, it's a phrase, a phrase, a sentence, or two sentences. But but yeah, not not a not a, not a paragraph. <laughs> the outdoors to me, it's it's a it's a it's it's almost kind of like symbolic symbolically uh, in the space of, um, of of resurrection for me. Um, as an angler, when I'm going out. Uh, there's a thing that I would say to a lot of my buddies and stuff, and I would say I'm about to I'm about to go wade in the water. I'm about to go get baptized all over again. You know, I'm not a spiritual man all the way to an extreme like that. You know, but it, a lot of that does come from my upbringing and what I've been exposed to. My father, my mother, you know, being on land and everything like that. You know, there's there's this there is a sense of rebirth. You know, even when you're when you're when you're planting. You know, uh, you know, or when you're even going on the hunt. Basically, you know, um, you know, and so uh, and I think there's a mix of my influence of, of, of interacting with indigenous cultures throughout my life, basically, um, that has come to that place where uh, I look at myself being in the outdoors, being on that water as being in Mother Nature's theater. And when I'm in her theater, I'm able to see and I'm able to tune into everything around me. I'm able to see the life and death that happens in front of me when I'm seeing the insects dancing on in the water. The mayfly is making its way up to the water, to the film, spread their wings, dry their wings, fly to the tree branch, turn different color, fall to a dun. The whole life cycle. I can see that, you know. Uh, it's, it's, there's, there's a rebirth that's happening of poetry all the time around me, you know. There's also a rebirth of myself stepping back in her, in, in nature's world. And then as I, exit her world, I'm exiting her world as I just got a dose of healing, you know? I just got a dose of charge uh, to take on life one more time, right? One more time, you know, one foot in front of the other, you know, and everything like that, you know? So, but yeah, it's, there's this resurrection, this rebirth is, is what the outdoors means to me and why I keep going back, you know? That's, that's perfect. And by the way, you did end up coming with up with one word. <laughs> <Even though you're laughs> <didn't> think, <laughs> but I, I, I can totally relate. I, I will tell you that when I fly fish, because I grew up fishing and, and uh, just to try and relate, um, whenever I fly fish, especially for salmon and steelhead, I always find that I'm resting one hand just touching the water. And it's like, and I'm just grazing it. And it's like I'm feeling it. It's like I'm literally somehow absorbing it completely through me and creating a, a loop and a flow. And that, you know, and I'm not mystic or religious in that sense either and 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 yet i do it every time i find it's almost subconscious and again same thing yeah absolutely that rejuvenation that rebirth and the same thing people ask me why do i like to go hunt if you you know maybe you don't even you're not even successful it doesn't matter yeah, yeah. so i think that that's that's awesome um chad and, and yeah i mean that's what i hear from everyone so Oh, there you are. You're back. Uh, I wanted to ask you to, before I, I round everything kind of back around, I did want to ask you if you had any final thoughts uh, and hopes, both from your article and from conversations like this. You know, um, final thoughts. Um, um, Back to you guys and the platform you guys give me and and many other platforms I step on to be able to uh, share. Uh, not everybody's going to be on board. I get that. I don't expect everybody to be on board. Uh, what I expect is people to basically, you know, sit with it for a little bit. 
think about it. You know, don't be quick to respond. Don't be quick to come up with solutions and ideas to sit with the things and try to develop a third eye to be able to look a little bit deeper. That's what I'm asking. I'm asking people to look a little bit deeper here into our humanity, into, you know, uh, the not just the outdoors, but the urban world and why things are happening. You know, it's quick to come up with the educational solutions and the collegiate, uh, you know, and it's quick. But what I'm saying is we need to look at the, the deepness of the TikToks that's happening within our soul as humans. We need to look deeper in opening up ourselves and practice love for one another. You know, uh, we each and every one of us need to take a journey, a self journey, you know, and that journey is 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 the reflection of self is the reflection of your steps in life. And it's also the study of what's happening in our lives. You know, we need to be more sensitive to that and we need to pay attention to what's going on. You know, uh, I just, you know, the in it where basically saying love is king, it's powerful. Uh, I challenge everybody to practice more with love instead of emotion and instead of what's up here. You know, there, we, we have done a lot of damage of what's up here. We've done a lot of damage, you know. Um, uh, and I just want to say this, what I mean damage, I'm talking about how we treat each other, okay? This right here has done phenomenal stuff. It's building in technology, of course. You know, that's not what we're talking about. What I'm talking about is dismantling the ugliness of hate and ignorance that lives around us and the death of what happens of just being black being brown and what we're trying to accomplish what we need and what you need we need community that's what we need that should be our ultimate goal build community when we build community is when we can say okay you know what we can not have to look at everybody as you know african-american blah 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 we can now look at it as a human race a human race, you know, and we need to learn how to love this human race, you know. But the first thing is acknowledging of who we are. The first thing is acknowledging of what we need to do and how we need to work together. All those solutions falls back to how we want to love one another. But it also starts with loving ourselves. I'm done. Well, and, and before we get into any question and answers, I just want to say you know, thank you for that. And um, I mean, I just want, I'm hoping that everyone who's watching has has really absorbed some of this, even if it's just a piece of it, to really examine themselves and everything going on in the world right now. We, as a society, we judge each other far too much. I agree with you, Chad. Um, I cannot even come close to a relating to everything that you've gone through, and hopefully I've heard you. Um, I have had my own experiences. I grew up Jewish. The most common common quote I still get today is, that's funny, you don't look Jewish. Mm. And my answer to that is, what's a Jew look like? <laughs> Why should I look like a Jew? Why do you have to be labeled a certain way because of the color of your skin? Mm. So I'm hopeful that people have really heard that. And again, before we get into the q and I'd like to personally thank you, Chad, and Soul River for your time, and as well for your service in the armed forces. Thank you so much for that. I really hope that everyone will look up Chad and Soul River on Instagram, Facebook, um, Google them. You, you do have a website. Is it, uh, do you know the website offhand? Yeah. Is it's, it Soul River Inc.? Yeah, soulriverinc.org. Soulriverinc.org. Okay. Soulriver yeah. So, so I hope everyone will, uh, will will look that up. And I'd like to take a moment um, to reflect on all that recently has tr transpired. And and for George Floyd and for you, I'm sure if you've received threats and negative <laughs> commentation on on these type of you know uh, interactions in the writing. And and really anyone who has had a life lost or imperiled based on color, creed, sexuality, anything. 
I'd like everyone just to take a five second moment, and just think. Okay, and with that, I do wanna see what questions we have because this was a very powerful and charged conversation and I appreciate it, Chad. So yeah. I do see um, a couple questions here. Here's one that says, uh, how can the predominantly white sportsman community better embrace people of color? And this is kind of a two-parter, so I apologize. I can repeat part of it. And then what burden of entries do you see the black community face that white hunters and anglers do not? So first, how can the predominantly white sportsman community better embrace people of color? And then what burden of entries do you see the black community facing that white hunters and anglers do not? Hmm. Uh, the first, um, the, the first question would be, you know, I can say is, um, you know, white hunters in the, uh, in the angling community, if I, I'm going to speak about organizations, if there's a big interest of wanting to, make change and do good of connecting with POC groups. Um, the how is connecting is um, approach a, a POC group of who you want to work with. Connect with the director or whoever there and have a sit down conversation. Here's the key, don't go in with that conversation of a savior's mentality. That's when you you that's when the barriers comes up. You want to go into that conversation with an open mind, open heart, and intentions to break bread in that conversation. Okay, when I mean breaking bread is get to know them, get to know them because you got to build the fundamental blocks first, and then when you build those fundamental blocks, that's when you can start asking the questions like. What are your challenges and where are you at? You know, what do you, what's your overall uh, goal? Sit back and listen to what they have to say, you know? And again, this is about listening. This is all about listening and, 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 and just taking in a lot of where they're at, what they're trying to accomplish, their challenges, their goals, uh, their success. You know, there's a lot. If you allow them to speak, allow them to share everything. And then come back in another meeting and say, hey, you know what? I got some ideas, but I would like to work with you. But this is how I like to work with you. I would like to basically integrate and help solve or help get from point A to point B together. Don't come with the, the mindset, I got a solution for you. That's not, the, that's not the way to work. If we want to work together, we plan together. We break bread together. This, you know, POC are culturally, uh, you know, uh, you know, well into their own culture of Hispanic, indigenous, Native American, uh, POC. They have their own deal of how they do things just as much as any other organization. But the idea is for you to celebrate what they're doing, celebrate who they are and celebrate what they're trying to accomplish and be part of that celebration acknowledge what's going on you know when you are working together you can solve things together you can build the bridges together and now you got a poc group that is a hundred percent part of your world we got a family we got a community you know and it's small steps because you know uh, what i'm talking about is is it's it's gonna it's gonna require you to feel uncomfortable, of course. Um, but um, but through feeling uncomfortable, it's gonna eventually graduate into a nice, healthy friendship, a trust, right? And we're working together, you know. So th those those are the basics. And I, as I said earlier, that's that's the basis of how we can work together. And and the one of the piece when you're working with a uh, like a director of a POC group, whatever. While you're working together, guess what? You can establish action steps. You know, these action steps are something that we're going to walk together and work together and hold each other accountable in these action steps. What, in order to have the action steps, uh, that white angler or hunter actually needs to sit and listen first of what they're doing and what they're trying to accomplish. When you can listen and digest what they're, what they're doing, 
that's when you can start moving forward and start saying, oh man, you know what? Love to be able to be part of this. Um, what if we able to create some action steps or something? That way it will hold me accountable in what I want to do and it would hold you accountable and we can like work together here to solve this problem together, you know? Uh, you know, uh, but having, but I would not go with the savers mentality that we're gonna come and save you with that mentality because that happens a lot and that closes up a door with a lot of PLC groups. It really does, you know, uh, and, and everything like that, you know? So that that's, you know, there's more steps you can do, uh, but those are the fundamentals that like to start the conversation, just to start, just to get things mm -hmm. going. Yeah, there was a second. Part. Yeah, I appreciate that. And the second part was, uh, what what burden of entries uh, do you see the black community face that white hunters and anglers don't? Uh, I suppose that could also be read as barriers. But basically, yeah, what are the the challenges essentially of entry to the to the outdoor uh, uh, community for for black hunters and anglers? Uh, there's 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 quite a few. I mean, uh, it's the I would say the the burden of entry is being you know some young people. Uh, I'm, when I'm what I'm what I'm about to say is um, uh, I'm not referring to uh, folks like myself of knowing how to navigate the back country. What I'm referring to is the body of more uh, POC groups that are already feeling comfortable and one of their biggest burdens is being by themselves in the outdoors, being by themselves. Some there's a you know I there's a, and and that's not just young people; it's also adults. I have received, again, uh, emails and thank yous from the article that I sent out from an African-American woman who's a photographer. She shoots birds in the outdoors. And I, I can't uh, uh, recite everything she said off of my memory, but it was more along the lines of, you know what? I love being in the outdoors. I like to go and, and, and hurry up and shoot and get my ass as quick as possible out of the outdoors because I'm so scared. I got to get to the car. I have to get the car and get out of there. Can you imagine being a photographer and going out and shoot birds? Can you imagine the burden that that person is carrying? That person is not really having the opportunity to just to actually breathe and exhale and enjoy. They're capturing some nice moments they're doing, but they're also doing it laced with fear. They're doing it laced with fear. You know, that's a weird space right there you know but that's a lot that, that's a, a big um burden is, is being alone uh being alone and, go, and going to the outdoors where you need um you know i think uh uh where you know the i don't want to go off into the whole police thing but uniforms that relates to weapons of course you know um those things uh, tends to be symbolically uh translated into fear um, you know, when you're dealing with, you know, people of color, especially from urban world and you got youth there, et cetera. Uh, the first thing comes to mind when they see, you know, a, a white hunter with a weapon or whatever, if they happen to be in that same space, he could be getting out of his car and pulling out his weapon out of the back of his truck or whatever like that, you know, those kind of, whatever, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of different ways of how that could be presented. If, that it is, let me say, it would only work if that hunter's conscience and understanding how they're presenting themselves, you know? Uh, and if the hunter is conscious of that, then there's an education piece of how you can make yourself not look so threatening when you are seeing people of color. That's an education piece that hunters will have to take upon and get educated. And there's like, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion classes and all that kind of stuff and everything. There's a whole there's a whole thing of alpha male maleness and how powerful that could be presented, uh, especially to people of color and also to the women, women. And then I talked a little, little bit earlier, there's a whole masculinity uh, conversation. That's a whole nother deal. But it's, you know, we're not aware of that if you don't understand it, you don't know, you wouldn't you would not even know that you are radiating that out. You wouldn't know if you're radiating that out, you know, uh, until it's actually pinpointed. And then there's an education piece that you would need to uh, learn of how we present ourselves and, and how we interact, you know, how we interact, you know, everything like that, you know. But um, but yeah, so there's a couple things. But yeah. OK, I appreciate that. And, and 
Uh, the next question, actually, I'm really curious if you have an answer to. I think it's a challenging question, and, and there might be some answers on your website if you have supporters. But uh, the question was, uh, we have the ability to, this is a good one in my opinion, we have the ability to use our dollars with responsibility and accountability. So are there any outdoor brands that have been allies that we should preferentially support? So, you know, are there brands that are more aligned with this type of vision and mission? Absolutely. You know what? I, I, I feel very honored and, and blessed of the platform and the work that I do uh, to be able to answer this question really, really strong. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, because, you know, I will uh, and I will comfortably say um, uh, Patagonia is an awesome brand. Uh, you know, and they have been doing the good work for a, a while. They they've been involved into a lot of pe uh, people color uh, outdoor groups. Uh, they've been involved into a lot of indigenous public lands. You know, they are really heavily involved with a lot and they've been doing a lot of the good work. One thing I liked about Patagonia when I'm working with them is, you know, sometimes you work with brands and a lot of brands. And when you take it, they're they they say, you know, make sure you use our logo, you know, make sure you wear this, all this kind of stuff. Patagonia, I, I had this many times, I said, you know, we don't care about that, Chad. We, we don't care about our logo. So, you know, we just want to make sure that, you know, you're, you're set up and you're doing the work that you need to do, period. You know, from this is from my experience of, of being affiliated and working with Patagonia. Keen Footwear is another one. King Footwear is a phenomenal brand. They've been doing the good work. Uh, they actually, well, due to the COVID stuff, they had to make changes, um, but they had this, um, oh man, I can't forget the, it was the King, um, um, uh, it's, it's, I forgot the name of the grant, uh, but it was specifically created uh, for uh, urban uh, POC groups, um, in the outdoors, basically, you know, and but and this has nothing to do between King and, and Patagon. This has nothing to do with George. OK, you know, it, this didn't happen. This been going this been going on for quite a few years, you know, uh, you know, a lot. You know, so the you know, the, the I think it's called the the Keen Effect Grant. That's what it's called, the Keen Effect. And uh, and so they've been really, really um, focusing and really trying to work with you know, POC groups, they've been, they have given POC groups a strong opportunity of financial support and also gear support and also beyond that resources for, uh, uh, for the group and everything like that for both groups and everything. Uh, you know, um, there's quite a few brands that's been doing pretty good that I can, I, those are the two that's come to my mind right now. Um, do you have a list on your, uh, website of, of, of companies that support you? Uh, yeah, actually, well, I don't really have a list, but it's actually on the homepage and you'll see, okay. actually, you'll That's see. What I mean, is that people who visit that can then see those companies. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Awesome. And I appreciate that. And then those are a couple of really good mentions. I know that we've worked, I, and I've certainly worked with both those companies in a variety of ways. So, um, the next one is, is sort of a ramble. I'm not going to lie <laughs> from Felton. It's, uh, it's not, it's partially a question, but it's also partially a statement. So I think he's got a lot of support here. So he said that when you said you were shot at, at first I was thinking you might mean while serving our countries overseas, that's so awful. I guess it's not the important thing and you don't need to say, but what rivers, question mark. We like to think other fishers and hunters are good folks, but there are poachers and some bad people just like anywhere else. And some behave worse because they are out of sight of other people. Of course, that's not really a question, but I'm not sure what to do about those 10% of outdoors people who suck. His words, not mine. Uh, anyway, everyone on the meeting is proud to know you and says thank you. So there's uh, some positive in there, but I guess maybe the question would be, um, you don't have to say the rivers if you don't want to, you can, but otherwise, maybe is there something you can speak to about what to do about those 10% those or however many it is, I don't really have a number, that aren't supportive? Uh, the ten percent aren't supportive. Meaning, what um, I can speak uh, the to people, people, the people yeah. who may be out there who aren't supportive of, of people oh. of color being in the outdoors. Yeah, yeah. And what they do? Well, number one is uh, I, I don't mind speaking the river. I, I was on the Clackamas River. Uh, ah. that's, that's, that's that, you know, 
Uh, and and that's, so that, that's, that's my home water. All right, that's just not right. <laughs> that's, that's where that's I'm not at. Right? That's, I, yeah, that's not right. I, I was on the clock, and and, and uh, you know, and it it uh, it 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 really it terrified me. Uh, I mean, yeah. you know, it's um, I'm trying not to get emotional because it just it just brings up a lot of stuff. You know, my dog. Uh, I think you know my service dog acts. Last thing I need is you know is is to is to experience me picking my dog up and carrying him off due to some racial shit. You know, um, so all I have in my life is my service dog. First thing I did was protect my service dog. That's what I did. The first thing when that happened, and and you know I grabbed Axe and I got the hell out of there. You know, and I was running and I actually picked Axe up. He did not run with me. I picked him up and I carried him along with everything else. And I just actually I dropped a lot of shit and I got carried him. And I got out there and we and we hit uh, uh, around the, the bush area where we were at and stuff. And then I forcefully, you know, basically covered on top of Axe and laid on top of my dog and everything. And I kept on saying, you know, Axe, it's OK. It's OK, buddy. It's OK. It's OK. You know, um, Hold on. So anyway, um, you know, the, I think the best, the, the one of the things that I don't, I, that I fear the most is, 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 is this fear of being a victim and you know, what I've done for my country, just like every other veteran, we come back, we, what we want to do is always be in safe spaces, have the hugs, be acknowledged. You know, with me being African-American and all the shit that I've been going through and everything like that, you know, I don't want to find myself like George where I'm a victim. That's, I got a problem of me being a victim, which relates to why I do carry in the backwoods, you know? Um, but the sad thing about that is, is that two things can happen with me. Number one is I can defend myself and draw my weapon to protect myself, protect my dog. Chances, I may not come out of that situation. That's the sad thing. You know, I may not come out of that situation. You know, that's a big gamble. We don't know what can happen. The other part is to, the other option is that I can draw my weapon, protect myself, and dismantle the situation if I'm able to do that. I will still not have justice come to support me. Either way it goes, I'm either going six feet under or I'm getting arrested and here I'm, I'm in the system. It's not just his word gets his, that person's word, but that person could probably be dead. I can't prove to myself. I can only say what I need to say, but no one's not going to come and help me. And I will be put in that system. That's the reality. Or I may not get to the opportunity to get put into that system. Things happens in the outdoors. There's a realness to that. Just as what, how, when the video was covering George, the only thing that saved the tipping point was the video footage. There's no video footage with me out there. You know, so anything could happen, you know. So um, to someone white, and you did that, option number one, what I just said, that's the similar thing what could happen to you just as much as happened to me. Option number two, what I just said, similar situation that can happen to me, to you. The difference is that you have an opportunity because the fact that justice can easily come in and support you. There have been many cases where people carry and they got a license and everything and you hear it all the time is that, you know what, the officer found out this real situation, what do you do? He gives his weapon, you end up going down to the station, you get your weapon, you go home. 
Sometimes it depends on the officer. Well, hand it back to you and everything. Whatever the case is, you get the opportunity to go home to your family. You get the opportunity to walk into the door and kiss your little girl. You get that opportunity. I got a different experience that happens and I got to think about those things. It scares me. It really, it terrifies me. Um, and when that day took place, even though I had my weapon, I didn't even draw it. I went quickly to protect my dog. You know, and I hid to make sure we had safe and we slowly worked our way through the woods and got back to my rig and I carried my dog. You know, so anyway. I appreciate you sharing those details. That's a, uh, yeah. I don't know if there's any, nothing I can say about that. That's, yeah. Uh, I'm going to shift away from that, just not because I want to, but because there's another question. But yeah. thank you for sharing yeah. that. Um, Sorry. The next question uh, asks Can you share some groups that are working on the front lines well in the outdoor? social and environmental space with the audience so that they can connect with them and learn more about how they can support a greater sense of community in the outdoors. So are there outdoor groups that yep. you would uh, recommend people look up aside from Soul River? Yeah. <laughs> exactly, right. Soul River is one. I'm just going to put that out there. We yeah, all please, everyone Google Soul River. I saw someone post it in the comments, the link. So please take a look at it. Um, uh, you have, uh, um, I think it's, uh, Brown folks, uh, Brown folks fishing. I believe that's their name. Brown folks fishing.com or dot org. You can find them on Instagram. Um, you know, it's a bunch of, uh, uh, people of color of anglers. Um, and, uh, they come together again, they come together, fish together. Uh, they do, you know, uh, think there's some conservation work that's involved, but they're literally on the front lines and what they're all about is creating more spaces in the outdoors to bring more uh, black and brown folks into those spaces to feel comfortable to fish. Uh, awesome group, you can find them uh, on Instagram. Uh, you can also, uh, I believe is uh, uh, Girl Trek. Uh, you can find them, they're on the front lines, all, all uh, you know, female, I believe it's all female uh, people of color group. Uh, you, I believe there's another one called uh, Brown Girls Climbing. If I'm not mistaken, you can find them and they are all about, you know, again, trying to make outdoor sp spaces uh, accessible for uh, people of color of women that are uh, backcountry climbers, you know. Um, let me think here off the top of my head. Um, outdoor Afro, um, really good friendship. Uh, I mean, friends uh, with uh, the president and founder. Her name is Rue Mapp. She's done a phenomenal job of harnessing and fostering uh, many, many uh, African Americans throughout the United States and urban world. Uh, she's actually uh, kind of like a pioneer. She's been around for for a good length of time, and uh, she steps and plays in a lot of political spaces, uh, outdoor spaces. But her ultimate goal is really more center right, not really more around the back country. But her ultimate goal is actually getting Black folks into nature. Uh, rather, it's national parks or even local parks. You know, it's 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 it's, it's being able to move African Americans into nature and have fun, have you know uh, outings and you know and 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 treks and and all that kind of stuff. You know, uh, but she's probably 80, 80 plus thousand strong <laughs> of followers wow. and everything like yeah. that. Yeah, she's a powerhouse, and she's been doing a great job of uh, of of really creating. Uh, an urban movement of, of people of color in the, in the outdoors to get them uh, into nature, basically. But there's there's quite a few uh, yeah. uh, uh, groups out there, you know, a handful of groups out there that are doing the good work. And and uh, there's actually uh, I just actually came across uh, I believe it's called Conservancy. Um, I, I can just uh, I'm gonna go here on my Instagram because they just text me. And I, I, it's my old Confluence collection. Uh, I believe they're out of Colorado, uh, but um, they're new. They're young, and they're there. It was interesting because they reached out to me, and they since the COVID and it stopped a lot of their programming. Uh, they what they've been doing? They've been doing um, um, 
Zoom fly tying meetups, <laughs> which is awesome, you know. And, yeah, yeah. and they asked me, asked me, do you tie flies? I said, yeah, I tie flies, you know. And they said, do, do you mind, uh, you know, maybe doing a Zoom with us when we record it? And I didn't know anything about it. I said, who you guys are? What are you guys about? And so he sent me a link and it goes to the YouTube page. And really, I was like, whoa, there's nothing but people, young people, 18, 13, young people of color sitting on YouTube channels all the way nice. to time flies. You know, nice. that's the world. I had I did not know that. You know, yeah. I was like, wow. Cool. You know, I said like, that's really cool. So what it is is that they would set up a time and you do a Zoom, they would record it, and uh, and they'll basically, you know, it's you teaching how to tie your fly. And they're teaching you how to tie their fly and they're exchanging patterns, you know. Uh, but, yeah, you can find them. I believe they're out of Colorado, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but, yeah, it's called Confluence Collection, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, but, you know, no, no. Yeah, something like that. But, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I personally, I mean, and, and I don't know if you saw this, Chad, I want to give a kind of a thumbs up. There's a company called Hunt to Eat and they uh, yeah. they. They, yeah. they picked up, uh, Matig uh, reached out to me and they picked up this story that we were doing this and, and definitely publicized it. And they have a big, um, they, they are not run by POC, of course, but they have a big uh, um, investment in equity uh, in the outdoors and, and in public, you know, wild spaces. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to know them and, and to, you know, to kind of work with them. And then also there's another one um, that had chatted me with this oh, about, um, uh, I think they're called uh, Queers and Camo on Instagram. Yeah, yeah um, I heard so, about them. There's yeah, a lot. A of, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, which is good. I mean, the more the more the better. The more voices, it, it becomes a, a tidal wave. Well, um, they're that's, operating in their own spaces, you yeah, know. And yeah. and that's and again, it's like to anyone that's being challenged and saying there's no racism now, there's no ignorance, all that kind of stuff. You got to be able to take a step back and look at the whole. Um, and here's the artsy side going to come out of me. You look at the whole gestalt, you know, yeah. <laughs> like I'm Picasso now, <laughs> you know, but <laughs> right, you know, and you got to look at every framework, every piece. When you look at the, all these pieces and all these groups, you got to look at it with the lens. It's like, wow, you know, that's awesome what I see, but they're operating in their own space. Why? Because they feel comfortable in their own space. And they feel comfortable of doing things together. They feel uncomfortable going by themselves, you know. And and so it's something to think about and to look at that. But yeah, there's a lot of uh, POC groups out there that are doing some phenomenal uh, work, but they're but they are operating in their own space. So, but yeah. Well, before we say goodnight, and I just say before, because I don't want you to sign off yet. Um, I don't know if you can see all the comments, but I've been reading just a ton of support uh, of you and your organization. Uh, one here from JR says, uh, Chad, I was on a trip to Alaska, and when I was getting picked up by Barry Whitehill, who I've also chatted with, I know you know Barry, uh, in Fairbanks, he was dropping off a crew of kids that had just been out with you. I have to say those kids were electric, and your experience that you shared with them clearly had, had a monumental, uh, will have a monumental point in their lives. What you do for kids and our vets is incredible. So that's from JR. Um there's another guy who says, Chad, you make the river cool again. <laughs> I think that pretty much sums it up right there. Um, so another one says, uh, this woman says, once COVID is over, it'd be great to meet you at a pint night in person. I admire your work so much. So Love I guess it. my only point is uh, you have a lot of fans. Um, maybe fans is the wrong word. Admirers, uh, people who are hearing, I hope hearing you and I hope that these conversations continue. I'm so excited that you're continuing the conversation and going on with other organizations because obviously it has to continue. It has to spread. It can't just be like you mentioned in a single small group in a small lens. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you again so much for your time. We really appreciated having you on. Uh, do you have anything else to say? Uh, you know, I don't really have much. I'll just say one thing. <laughs> you know, out, out of all we talked about to everybody. Um, you know, doing and working together and doing the, the good and to make change, it's um it's it's not a hundred yard dash. We have to prepare ourselves to go a marathon, you know, and and so uh when we can start thinking in the long term space of how are we gonna achieve this marathon, you know, is how we prepare ourselves from the starting blocks in order 
to make change because it's not going to happen overnight. It's something that's going to happen as we grow and work together. And that's a marathon right there. And we're going to have to really train our hearts for that because training our hearts is what uh, lends itself to, you know, uh, uh, following the love that we, that we need for one another. Love is king, period. Yeah, I think, I think you finished it up perfectly right there. Love is king. So appreciate you so much, Chad. And I just want to say good night and thanks to everyone for showing up. And, uh, you know, Sawyer, if you're listening, you can kind of, I don't know how you wrap this thing up because it's the first time I've done one of these, but uh, uh, well, we're getting a lot of thank you messages in chat again. Thank you so much. And like I said, let me, uh, look me up, man. Let's go fish the clack. I, I mean that. Let's go get you into a steelhead. I, I don't know if you caught one yet, but I read on your body. <laughs> yeah. and, so, uh, let's yeah. go get you into that steelhead. Oh, one, but, you know, catching a steelhead is that that is it always it's always like the first time, you know. So yeah. 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 Well, let's let's see if we can do it. So thank you, everyone, and uh, everyone have a great night. Uh, I don't know. Hopefully, Sawyer will sign us off here, but you can just close your browser. And